In 1786, a group of prominent thinkers of the time uh, that were involved in the Sturm und Drang movement were beginning to feel a bit disenfranchised of the concept and a new aesthetic movement was beginning to develop that took uh, ideals of the Enlightenment, Classicism, and Romanticism. Calling it Weimar Classicism, uh, major writers of the earlier Sturm und Drang movement that was fizzling out around this time, um, notable authors such as Herder, Schiller, and Goethe, uh, were beginning to write some of their most notable works. Though it is a movement of very few authors and uh, historians are on disagreement on whether to call it a movement at all, when looking at the works produced, it becomes very difficult to ignore its influence. I am Pei Vio, and this is Pay Attention, and today we'll be looking at the 33 years of German history that make up Weimar Classicism. In 1788, Goethe would return back to Germany after a two-year stay in Italy where he would partner with Friedrich Schiller on a new literary venture. Though it is up for some debate, as stated earlier, whether or not uh, Weimar classicism can stand alone as its own movement, um, it's not debated on its importance to Romanticism, it borrowing so many of its themes. And if you were to place uh, the beginning of Romanticism at 1815, as many do, it would make sense that it could be its own movement, or at least a good segue from Sturm und Drang to Romanticism. Two years prior, 1788, Goethe left to Sicily, where he had spent his whole life with the ambition of being able to see the Roman architecture in person. Uh, during this time, he would write a book titled uh, Italian Journey, where he states, Without Sicily, Italy creates no image in the soul. Here is the key to everything. Upon returning to Germany, it was quite clear that he believed just that. He mentions in his journals uh, during this time that being surrounded by the sea gave him a new uh, set of ideals. And though he ventured to Rome to, and Sicily to see the uh, ancient architecture, he was just as enthralled by the nature that constantly surrounded him. When he completed his tour of Italy, he brought back with him to Germany a new vision for the developing literary movements. It was not long after, in 1794, that Goethe would meet Friedrich Schiller, finish his second novel, Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship, and uh, with his new acquired friend would begin the project that would further develop the culture of Germany. Frederick Schiller was born on November 10, 1759. He was educated in medicine at a military academy, and soon after the publication of his first poem in 1777, he began to study and write drama. This would prove to be a lifelong endeavor after his first play, The Robbers, which premiered in 1782, became an immediate success, giving him international recognition. Due to the play's rebellious and revolutionary themes, he fled his hometown, Duchy of Württemberg, to avoid being arrested. He settled in the town which premiered his play, The Robbers, Mannheim, where he would begin an extensive literary career. After a decade of writing poetry, dramas, and history, including a text on the Thirty Years' War, he would be appointed as professor at the University of Jena. There, his popularity would grow, teaching history and philosophy of aesthetics. But as his status as a revolutionary figure grew and the French Revolution raged onward toward a more unnecessary, violent transformation, he became disenchanted with its message and direction, eventually leaving the university and giving up his passion for drama to pursue a more strict study in philosophy. During this time, he contributed much in the field of aesthetics, writing on the sublime, as well as studies on the human condition, such as his work on naive and sentimental poetry. 
After a short break of writing drama, Frederick Schiller would begin to meet with Goethe in 1794, and these uh, meetings would reignite his passion for playwriting and would begin what would be quite possibly the most important and meaningful relationship in all of Western literature. And though the relationship uh, started off with only written letters, if I remember correctly, about a thousand were passed back and forth over a span of a decade, it did uh, influence Goethe to uh, re-examine his old play that he had put down for quite some time, uh, a play that would become Faust. And though no one would disagree that it is Goethe and Schiller who contributed most to the Weimar classical movement, uh, there is one man who is of great importance and uh, inspiration to Goethe and his ideas and aesthetics, as well as what Goethe believed that the Weimar classicism movement should be. And that was a painter, uh, an author who wrote primarily on the arts, and Goethe's good friend he met in Weimar upon his return from Italy in 1787, a man by the name of Johann Heinrich Meyer. But with these few mentions, there is one other who had great importance on these authors, uh, a student of Kant and a philosopher who would inspire the romantics to come. <sighs> to tell us a little bit more about this man, uh, here is our friend Stiller. Gottfried Herder. Unlike uh, other previous philosophers who had written on uh, aesthetics, such as the founder of the field, Alexander Baumgarten? Baum? Baum? Baumgarten? Ba Baumgarten? Herder questioned an a priori approach to aesthetics and uh, looked more closely at the field with a with an empirical eye but apart from aesthetics there there is another reason in which herder stands to be uh, very popular amongst the romantics and that was the importance he put on language and the use of language not only for aesthetic reasons but uh he also believed that all language was poetic in the sense that all language was metaphor this, of course, would have great influence on another philosopher that we all know and love. I couldn't find a picture of him with a mustache, so I had to draw one on. What Herder means when he says that all language is metaphor is really that all thought is constricted to language and its purpose is to project a comprehensible image to the receiver, if you will. He believed that for one to be able to have a thought at all, one needs to be able to think in a language, simply do, because we all think in a language. His works such as Treaties on the Origin and Ideas were the foundation for all modern linguistics. With Romanticism on the horizon, a philosophy that looked at language was really pivotal for its success, especially Herders in which he put language on, uh, on, uh, on a very poetic pedestal. In books such as Attempt at uh, History of Lyric Poetry, he points to the importance poetry had in developing religions uh, as well as moral education, a uh, notion that's still very heavily discussed today in regard to fiction, particularly science fiction, and its role it has to play in society uh, developing a common morality. Now, Herder is one among many philosophers who gets propped up as a proponent of many controversial issues in society today. That is for another episode. For now, it is important to note that Herder's ideas on language, combined with his conclusions on the history of lyric poetry and how it shaped myth and religion, was something that the Romantic writers took very seriously. 
Borrowing a lot from Spinoza, the concept that God is in all of nature and that the Bible is mythology, that it is supposed to project images on the mind, were ideas that were all strongly agreed upon uh, amongst all the leading authors the largest literary movement in all of Western culture shared. Man. Thanks, Doug. As it is, uh, Weimar Classicism may have uh, produced few works in comparison to other literary movements, but its influence um, is arguably just as important to the Romantics as, say, the Sturm und Drang. In future videos, I do hope to go over some of the more important works individually, but I do hope that this one served as a small introduction, and if you want to hear anything more about some of the other authors that we've talked about in this particular video, I have done other things on them before, which I will provide with links below. Next week, we will move away from this particular period and look at something completely different in German literature. So, thanks again for watching, and I uh, hope to see you next week.